Hey, so I'm Jeff Klein, also known as Surreal. I'm a composer and sound designer. And we're going to be talking about uh, understanding the role that music and sound design, or just sound, has in video games. Uh, so first of all, I'm just curious, how many people here work in audio with game development? OK, a few of you. That's good. Not, low numbers is good, because that means I get to inform more people. So I'm not preaching to a choir. So uh, basically, what makes a video game and what makes a good video game? Good video game is going to have good visuals, you know, good character art, good, you know, beautiful landscapes, etc. Good audio, music, sound effects, silence, which is also very important. I'll be talking about that later. The lack of sound or music. Good story or narrative. Um, good character dialogue, things like that. Good gameplay. Does it feel good to play? Does it feel have a good balance between not too difficult, not too hard? or not too easy, not too difficult, you know what I mean? And the suspension of disbelief, which is the desired goal of all of these things together. Um, so does anyone here not know what the suspension of disbelief is? Everyone knows? Perfect. Well, in case anyone doesn't know or is watching this on YouTube later, I asked a good friend of mine for a very formal definition. And he told me that Suspension of disbelief is the willingness to suspend one's critical faculties and believe something surreal, sacrifice realism and logic for the sake of enjoyment, which in layman's terms is basically, have you ever played a video game and you get so absorbed in it that you just play it for hours and you just don't want to stop and you're just so into the world that you lose track of all your outside thoughts, all your worries go away and you're just so you know, stuck in awe of how beautiful Tamriel is and also in awe of how ugly the character models are. And even though this hedgehog is wearing shoes and people are shooting fire out of their sticks, you, normally you'd be like, that's not real. But it's like, oh, in this game, it's okay. That's the suspension of disbelief, is being so absorbed into it that the inside world of the game is normal, in your subconscious at least. Like, you know you're still in your living room, I would hope. Maybe if you're playing a VR. But, uh, you know, it's basically getting so absorbed into the game that it's just, it kind of takes over and you get into the game's world. That's the ultimate goal of every developer is to get people really involved. So what does music contribute to the whole grand scheme of things? Um, the main things are environment and ambience, just, you know, background music, and it helps set the tone for what the player should be feeling in that specific area or instance. Um, it's unfortunate, I'm gonna have to, I have like four or five music clips, so um, feel free to be quiet. I mean, you are quiet, but shh. <laughs> I'm gonna give a first example here. Um, so I want you just to listen to this and just kind of soak it in and just tell me what kind of moods you may feel when you listen to it. How do you do this? There we go. It's simple, right? But it's very tense. A lot of suspense going on. Very serious, but it's also kind of relaxing in a sense, right? Which is fitting for this because this only plays when you beat a boss in Super Metroid and you're about to grab the new item that'll help you beat more baddies or in the save rooms. So it kind of gives us a, you know, it only plays when you're safe, basically. And, but it has that luring suspense of like, there's still danger all around me and I don't know where the next threat is coming from, which, you know, Super Metroid has a lot of ambient soundtracks, but it's like that sort of, uh, you know, there's, you can have really suspenseful or just ambient that sets that under overall tone of like what the area is like and kind of like how you feel while you play the whole game. And then there's more direct like melodic um, kind of tone as to how the player should be feeling. Um, some context between this or behind this theme um, this is a theme from the game Soul Blazer or Soul Blader in Japan. Um, basically, the context is you are sent from God, you're an angel, and you have to defeat the demon Death Toll. And this is basically God's theme talking to you and putting you on your mission. 
very regal, yes. But suddenly, there's a sense of danger, sense of importance here, and kind of being in awe as like God is talking to you, saying, chosen warrior, <laughs> the demon death toll is taking over the lands, and it is up to you to save the world. And it just sets that tone where the, subconsciously the player hears this and they realize the importance of this character, but also they get put in this mood like, yes, I'm gonna go on an adventure, like, let's do this. I'm ready to save the world. And it gets them ready and pumped. And it's not like the first theme where they're like, looking around like, what's, you know, what's around me? What's dangers lurking in the shadows? This is like, I'm gonna find that, you know, find those shadows and kick their ass. So it sets the tone and kind of tells the player how they should be feeling. Let's see. So another thing that music contributes is it presents characters or themes with, through the motif and light motif. Um, so if, uh, here's a little music terminology lesson. Um, a motif, they're fairly similar where a motif is a general melody or a theme that plays throughout a movie or a play or a game that just kind of ties all of the music together. Uh, I'm gonna use uh, Undertale as an example since they use this melody in multiple of their tracks. And it's a simple little melody that you'll just hear throughout the whole game. Oh, just kidding. This thing's finicky, there we go. You hear this in the intro, you hear it in some boss fights, some themes throughout the game, and it doesn't represent any one character or idea but it's just there to make tie everything together and kind of make the whole world feel connected. And this is a light motif is more specifically tied towards a character or a group of characters or general feeling. So say for example, um, just like if not a character, then say for example, Final Fantasy VII, they have the Shinra Corporation they have multiple people under Shinra, and they, whenever each of them's introduced in the game, it just plays the Shinra theme. So it's like all, they're all kind of boxed together. They don't get their own cool themes, usually. Or it could just be the idea of like, oh, this is like the dark side theme or whatever. So you hear someone's theme song, but then has elements of the dark side theme playing with it. It's like, oh no, they've gone to the dark side. <laughs> but the leitmotif is very important because it can help tell the personality of a character when they're introduced and it helps the player understand what kind of person like what kind of character they are so i chose a leitmotif from the game chrono cross and this is from some bad guys that you'll encounter on a recurring basis and i want you to listen to this and tell me what kind of uh what kind of bad guys do you think these two are this is the theme of salt and pepper so tell me what you think of these guys when you hear them as enemies that you fight. Very intimidating, right? <laughs> Fearsome foes. Makes you shiver in your boots. Oops. In truth, these enemies, they are enemies and they are recurring, but they're, it's basically they're two idiots that get sent to kill you, but each time they do, they're kind of a tutorial enemies, they're bosses. So they try to introduce a new thing, like, oh, here's summoning, I'm gonna kick your ass at summons. And then since they're both idiots, they mess it up, shoot themselves in the foot, you laugh at them, you beat them up, and you just keep going on your quest. But the thing that's nice about this is that like, as soon as you enter the fight, you know, if we'd use like a serious theme, we'd be like, oh no, these are some serious bosses. But as soon, since you hear that theme, you're like, this is the boss? What? You know? So you realize that right away that these guys are just kind of a joke and that they, they're not really there to be like an intimidating force. And the power of, you know, the light motif kind of just instantly sets that idea that like to the player, like, oh, this, these two characters are stupid or they're very serious characters. They're very you know, lighthearted or courageous, and they, it just tells you what kind of qualities a character has just through the music. 
So other things that music contributes, it guides the player in a direction, or in some cases what they should be doing. This is where silence comes into play very often. Um, say, for example, you're starting a new game, and the, the, they just tell you, like, oh, go to the village chief to get the key to leave the village. And you can openly explore, and you're like, no, screw that, I see a cool cave over there. And there's happy beach music, you're making your way, and as you get closer to this cave, the happy music starts dying down a little bit, and you get in front of this cave, and it's just silence. And you just peer into the darkness, and maybe some red eyes start glowing, and you're just like, I'm gonna go see that village chief. I'll come back here after 20 more levels. Silence will tell you, this, it's a good way of telling a player, no, don't, you know, you can go this way, but you're gonna die. You should go, go see the chief. Go over here, come back when you're ready. Or perhaps you're going through a dungeon and, you know, everyone's had this feeling. You're going through like a tough area and then you reach a room that's, you know, suddenly the music just stops. It's an empty room. Maybe there's a save point in the corner, and you're like, something's about to go down. You know, I should heal, I should check my equipment, I should reload, I need to get ready. And it tells you exactly that, you know, you, the silence is saying, you know, it does, it's not necessarily a save point because it could be at any point in the dungeon, but the silence is saying something's about to happen, you need to prepare yourself. Um, something else music does is it reinforces the story, events taking place. That one's pretty self-explanatory, like if it's, say, a sad cutscene, and there's, you know, people are sad, the music's just basically saying, you should feel sad, you should feel happy. It helps make the game memorable. There's a lot of video games I'm sure we could all name that you can remember them by their soundtrack, maybe almost more than the actual gameplay. Or you just remember the game very well for its soundtrack. And this means that the game gets good reviews, good sales, people have nostalgia, you make a lot of money, all the good stuff. So this is why it's good to have good music. Should, you have your own, should your game have its own composer or sound designer? Short answer, yes. <laughs> Long answer, uh, yeah. Okay, but why? Well, you, you know, why, do, why hire a composer when I can get some stock music for like five or 15 bucks or whatever? And the reason is just because music, when you have your own composer, they can work with you to make music such as light motifs or motifs specific for your game, for your characters, for your environments that fit exactly how they need to be. There's a lot of consideration that composers have when they compose a theme to make sure that it fits with a certain, you know, certain area, a certain character, or any setting. Um, there's a lot of, thought that goes into arrangement perhaps, like say you have a character who's very, like he's a cool bad boy, he's got a leather jacket and sunshades. His melody is probably gonna have like a funky, you know, funky bass guitar, electric guitar, something cool. And then if you have like a proper aristocrat or something, he would have no less than a, a violin or, you know, a lovely harpsichord. Something that really suits his music. And if you have stock music, maybe you have something that has like a harpsichord, but it's not gonna be appropriate for that thing. And you can't have like a motif, for example, like that little melody in Undertale that plays everywhere. And you know, you're not gonna find a bunch of stock music with that same little melody playing all over the place. And basically, you, you just can't have it music that fits your game. Because your game should have nothing less than music that fits it. Because your game deserves the best. And basically, if you sell yourself short by getting stock music, your game is gonna feel like a stock generic game, to put it bluntly. But money, you know? We don't have money. Well, you know, good audio is gonna help your game sell better. So it'll work out for you. You'll hire more game composers, so that the audio dev side of the, you know, of the industry gets more work. So everyone's more successful overall. You make money, they make money. It just works for everyone. I know it's like kind of a, a push to find funding sometimes, but most composers are very flexible with, you know, with finding affordable um, pricing options for, you know, developers, whether it's like um, profit sharing. So say if you sell a game, and you're just kind of, basically, they will make like, say for example, 10% of your profits, and then maybe like a cut of something else. Or there's like, 
They can pay by the hour, you can pay per track, pay per minute. There's lots of different options and there's endless composers out there looking for work, so you'll, you can find someone in your price range too if that's enough of an issue who can still deliver what you need for your game. So how can you work with composers and sound designers? Um, the best thing you can do, well, not, well, the first thing I should say, is to get all your ducks in a row first, which if you're basically figure out how much music or sound effects you will need, found out, you know, find out if you can get a good list of all that you need, like, okay, I'm gonna need, I'm gonna have 15 villages or whatever, towns, and I want them each to have their own theme and then a nighttime variation. And I want like this specific battle to have its own theme or I want, I don't know, just I, I want to save music theme, but I also want it to be shared with this theme or have a connection to this. And the more information you have right off the bat that you can give a composer, the less they have to work in the dark and ask you a bunch of questions, which will happen anyways, which brings me to my next point. These two stars, I kind of consider the more important points. Um, thorough, consistent communication is vital with composers especially. Um, expect to get a lot of questions from composers saying like, who is, what is this character like? What is this village? Like who lives in this town? Or what is the situation of this, you know, this post-apocalyptic area that I'm running through and gunning people down? Like why, why is it destroyed? You know, how long ago was it destroyed? Why am I doing all this? And they, they'll just constantly ask for context because that's very important to how they will you know, consider to write the melody, what arrangement of instruments they'll use. And it's, it's just very, um, it's both ways though, because it's good for you to just constantly communicate with them saying like, hey, how's it going? Do you need any extra information? What are, you know, any updates? And having that communication will make sure that they deliver the most fitting product for you instead of just kind of being like, hey, I need something sad. And it was like, oh, is this what you mean? I don't know. This sounds sad. <laughs> uh, the other thing is reference tracks or audio clips. Um, so basically, if you have like an exact track that you really like, like, oh, I love this music because it has this very victorious trumpet sound, or I like this because it has a cool synth sound. If you can have details within that too, that'd be great. But any like specific tracks or like even just a notable like game that you like, say like Super Metroid. Like I want a game with a lot of ambience like Super Metroid. Even if the composers never played a Metroid game, they'll be like, okay, I'm going to listen to a whole bunch of Metroid game soundtracks and see what makes that sound so they can get a good idea of what you want. But if you want say like a specific track for a certain, you know, certain thing, you can, if you can find ex like exact tracks or like you know, a collection of tracks that sound similar and point out why you like those things, it'll make, so, it makes things so much easier for composers. And the same thing with audio clips, like for like a, from a sound design standpoint, to be like, oh, I want my shorts, my a sword sheathing sound that has like an epic little, you know, a little epic anime draw out. A sound designer is gonna be like, okay, I need to make, from their point, they're gonna understand it's like, okay, I need to get some metal things, a sheathing sound, and then I have to, I have, to add some reverb and delay to do that little ch -ch -ch -ch. And it, it puts it into terms that they understand when they can hear a specific clip, because then they, you know, they have more trained ears to, you know, re, you know, in order to understand what they need to record to get a sound like that. The other thing is just concept art, playable builds, screenshots. If there's anything you can actually present to the composer that they can visually see or the sound designer, that makes so much of a difference for them. Because maybe they were thinking that you had, like you asked me to write a swamp theme. I'm like, okay, I was thinking you meant like a, maybe a spooky swamp, but you were thinking more like southern you know, voodoo swamp. I see like all these like witch doctors. I'm like, oh, I gotta rewrite this now because this kind of sounds more spooky than witch doctory, whatever that means. <laughs> but being able to do that and like play it with, you know, maybe play the game and incorporate the sound and see how it fits when you're actually playing it can make a big difference. And same with audio as well, because maybe the audio person is just like, oh, I need a hammer sound. 
It's like, oh, this is actually a big hammer, so I need a big hammer <laughs> sound. Not like a little bink. So it makes, it makes a difference with audio, like with sound designers as well. Um, the last thing is just to be understanding of the time and work required on their side. There's a lot of consideration that goes into effect when a composer decides on how they create a tune to make something work. Um, there's a lot of consideration for arrangement, for the melody, how it ties into other themes, and there's, it just takes time. So the best thing is just to be understanding of that and just communicate with them how things are going. So this here is a little gift that I have. Um, I didn't actually ask you if, you if there's like a place I can upload this for people to download it. Perfect, okay. So this here is the mood wheel, also known as the motion wheel. It goes by different names, feelings wheel. And basically this is a tool that is like every composer's best friend. And basically it has, if you notice, all the different moods here. Does it show the mouse? Yes. And it shows the subsets of those moods. So this help will help bridge that gap between composer and developer where if you may not know how to to explain what exactly you want in terms of music, this will help you. So you can be like, hey, I, you know, I have a very hostile character. So a composer is gonna be like, okay, hostile is very aggressive and angry sounding, so I need to write something very aggressive and angry. But there, you can also be like, oh, but he's also got a kind of judgmental personality. So you're like, okay, I need to do something with shows disgust and disappointing, because otherwise, the composer is going to be like, okay, how do you write, you know, disgust in music? What does disgust sound like? And this helps the composer tremendously, but it also helps developers as well, you know, by communicating what exactly they are feeling. So it's like, you know, oh, I want angry music. It's like, do you want angry or do you want jealous? Or do you want frustrated? So it helps bridge that gap. So I'm going to figure, I, we're, we're going to figure out how I can upload this so that I would recommend everyone would, all developers and composers, you know, find a wheel like this, you could download this one or find another one, and you guys can use this to kind of bridge that gap in communication so you guys are on the same page. Because when you're on the same page, he can compose what you need or write the sound for what you need, and there's no, it just makes everything more efficient. And that's about it. Any questions? Yeah. My favorite video game for music. My favorite soundtrack is actually Chrono Cross. Every soundtrack on it is so phenomenal, and it just it nails every environment just right. There's good light motifs. It's just all. It's just overall a spectacular soundtrack. I would definitely recommend it. Yeah. There's quite a few. Um, <laughs> Yes, um, a lot of them will be in NES games, like the Silver <laughs> Surfer. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, the Pictionary title theme. Horrible game, but the title theme is, it's killer. <laughs> no, really, it is. Go live, it's good. Um, I'm trying to think. Off the top of my head, what else has a really good soundtrack, but is a bland game? Um, I can't think of any more off the top of my head, honestly. but. Just there's, I mean, sure, if you just looked up on Google, like, bad games, it's good soundtracks, you'll find a lot. Yeah, over there. I was just wondering if you could talk about uh, lyrics and singing in games, because I feel like that's a really tricky thing to pull off. It is. I think it does two things. Like, you can have, like, a really nice cherry on top to a moment, like, in Bastion. When Correct. Yeah, there's definitely a reason why you usually only hear it in the context of like an intro theme or like the beginning of the game or the very end of the game during the credits. And it is kind of that thing where video game music is usually set to loop. So having the song loop on end forever would just drive people nuts. And I'm not really sure why it is that we consider lyrics so much more grating to listen to over and over, but um, 
It's just hard to do it on loop, is really the short answer. Yeah? Uh, when you think it's a good time to bring people that are like, what you thought was the time The earlier the better, honestly. Um, since if a composer is brought into a project early, it allows them time to make mistakes as well. Like the whole development process, you know, there's gonna be points where you make something like, oh, this doesn't work, and you're trying to figure out how to make everything come to life. And there's gonna be that point with composers and sound designers as well where maybe they'll submit something and they need to revise it. So the earlier they can do it, the better, but there's also a point where it can be too early where if they don't have, if you don't have your game together where you don't know ex everything you wanna do yet and you don't have your whole, your, you know, your idea's not all there or you don't have, um, anything to show for like concept art or screenshots or anything to play, it might be a little bit, it might be too early. For some composers it's okay, but for others they need that, they can't, you know, it's hard for them to function without any visuals or any info of what, you know, the, the setting is for their music. So it's kind of an in-between. Um, I can't really, I mean, I, I can say like maybe 40% through, but you know, that doesn't really, what does that mean to most people, you know? So it's, the earlier the better is usually the best time. Uh -oh. <laughs> Computer blue screened. All right, any other questions? Yeah. Adaptive soundtracks, you mean like um, soundtracks that'll kind of like f more like fade out of one and go into another one? Yes. Um, is your question specifically how you would do that, or? Um, I've had a little bit of experience. It is, it's um, very specific in how you do it in execution. Usually those soundtracks will have the same BPM, and they'll usually be in the same key. So it kind of just makes it so you just change the sort of, usually you just change the beat or the pulse of the song to kind of transition from one to the other. Fury is a good example of this. Um, when you change between the phases like the melee combat and kind of, or like when you're kind of doing more of the damage to them and like when you're just kind of dodging attacks, the music will change, but it stays all in the same key and same rhythm, but it seamlessly transitions between the two. And there's also uh, vertical layering, which uh, Portal 2 does that a lot, where it kind of has a bunch of independent layers of like sounds or melodies and they just kind of fade in and out on top of each other and it's usually just kind of set on timers with like you know, this beat coming with this one and this one and it can be randomized or it can just be when this happens then fade to this one um yeah i don't know <laughs> yeah all right i sold no more questions so thank you so much yeah.